I'm very happy to have Taryn Kayward with us today. So Taryn is a research scientist with the Geological Survey of Canada. So Taryn and her colleagues have been investigating the distribution of various critical metals in VMS deposits and how deformation and metamorphism can affect this at a micro to macro scale. So this talk is going to give us a great summary of their ongoing research and it's going to be a great session. So I hope you all enjoy it. Um, please keep using the chat. I love this. We've got Peru, Vancouver, Quebec, Saskatoon, Hobart, Mexico, Perth. This is awesome. So we've got a fun global crowd. So come have some fun with us. Uh, yeah, use the chat. We'll open up the floor at the end. Um, but yes, thank you, Taryn, for joining us today. It's um, I Thank thought, you, Jess, so much for inviting me. It's so good to have you here. Um, I thought before we got stuck into your presentation, um, I'd really love to know what got you into geology in the first place. Ooh, okay. Um, tricky one. So you know how like every little kid wants to study dinosaurs? Yeah. I just never really grew out of that. It just kind of expanded to like, oh, fossils are cool. Oh, wait, they're in cool stuff too that also tells a story. And then it just kind of spread from there. So I, I'm still a little kid obsessed with the dinosaurs. I just do dinosaurs and rocks now. <laughs> and so how long have you been with the Geological Survey of Canada for now? Um, about two years. So two. just enough time to say that I've actually survived some Canadian winters and they're not that bad. They're quite <laughs> bad. But, uh, I, I was worried for the first time, but it's... it's I bet incredible. you were. Okay. Yes. We were talking about it before we went live that... um. I'll be off the PDAC in a couple of days and I'm not ready for the weather shock because it's so humid here at the moment. So it's, um yeah, Canadian winter is something different. <laughs> yeah. It's special. It's special. <laughs> uh, so what's, um what sort of things did you do before you started with the survey? Um, so I'm originally from South Africa. I did all my undergrad and my master's and everything in sunny, warm, dry South Africa. <laughs> And then I spent a couple of years in the mining industry, actually looking at base metal deposits up near the Namibia border. So hot, dry, red desert, as different as you can possibly get to Canada. Um, spent a couple of years there in production, which was really fun. Like we were in a super messed up, highly deformed, remobilized ore deposit. So it was like really interesting to see it all in 3D and try yeah. to fo try follow it. And then... It was quite cool. It was quite a big company. But after I was there for a few years, they opened up an exploration team. So even though it was a big company, I joined the exploration team and it was a really small group of us. So I kind of got to do a bit of everything right from the start. Yeah. So I was like planning drill programs and wireframing resources and doing you know, regional um, project design, like all sorts right from the start. Um, yeah, I did a couple of years of that. And then went over to California to do a PhD in structure and deformation and shear zones. So I was like, all deposits are cool, structure's cool. I've got to kind of catch up on the structure before I um, settle down too much. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then it was from there that I kind of got into Canada and finally got a cool job over here looking at deformation and all deposits. I love that. That is amazing. So with all of your travels around the world, have you got some pet rocks for us today to have a look <laughs> at some of your favorite? I understand yes. you've got quite a few, so we'll take some of the so, favorites. For, for the audience, you guys are lucky. Most of them are at the office, so we won't go through too many. <laughs> uh, which, which pile do I start with? Um, so, okay, the coolest rock in the world is a really good myelinite. Anything that's been deformed and tectonically abused, but unfortunately, all my shear zone rocks are in the office. So you guys are getting really cool pegmatite crystals instead. Oh, it's, it's basically an emerald. So this is a big chunk of beryl from the Orange River pegmatite group in South Africa. And yeah, base for scale, it's a nice big one. And... Pigmentites are really cool for crystals because they're huge. So we've also got a piece of spodumene here. Ooh. As you can see, you know, just a, just a little desktop. How heavy is that? Uh, it's 
Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, it's not lead or something, so then I would not be picking it up. <laughs> but um, yeah, so spodgy me, wow. always a good one. And uh, hmm, let's do one more, maybe. Uh, a chunk of flow banded rhyolite from California. And this is cool because, like, it looks like it's got a bit of a shear zone going. It looks like it's been smeared out. And that all happened when this was still viscous lava, just kind of flowing out over the surface. So that's a kind of fun structure, but is it leaf formation? Mm -mm. So, yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll stop now. Otherwise, I'll take I love this. Me. This is so good. Thank you for the show and tell. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'll let you get stuck into your presentation now. Awesome. So yeah, Jessica, thank you so, so much for inviting me to be here today. Um, I've been following GeoHug since way back in the early pandemic days. So it kind of, it feels really special to be invited onto something that I've kind of followed for so long. It's like, oh, I feel famous. This is awesome. <laughs> um, so, and hello everyone in the audience. Um, so as Jess said, we are looking at work that I'm doing with the Geological Survey of Canada, looking at critical metals in massive sulfides and how deformation and metamorphism can kind of affect those. So just this is just a nice picture of some deformed sulfides to get started. And um, we've changed scale instead of the giant chunk of spodumene, we're now looking at stuff in thin section. And, oh, let me just get my pointer up. Hang on. There we go. So in the middle here, we've got a really competent pyrite porphyroclast. That's been wrapped by this foliated pyrotite, slightly darker brown. And then we've got these tails of the yellow chalcopyrite. So really spectacular microstructures in these things. So before we dive in, I just want to say a huge thank you to my colleagues at the survey who are working on this with me. So it's Jan Peter, Matt Polivchuk is our EBSD expert, Dwayne Petz and Janina Zas are working on the laser ablation and they've been working magic with the mapping that we're doing. And I also want to note that most of this work is part of a paper that's about four days away from being submitted. So if you're interested, keep an eye out on economic geology. Hopefully it'll come out there. Um, so to start with, what do I mean by critical metals? Well, critical metals, also called critical minerals, critical materials, it's all the same thing. They are non-fuel materials. So we're not looking at oil and gas. Non-fuel materials that are considered essential to the economy and national security of a country. So that counts um, a lot of the stuff that's going into smartphones and laptops. And also stuff that's going into defense applications. Like apparently you need rare earth elements to make infrared night vision goggles for use in the military, which I was like, that's kind of cool. So nowadays, this is increasingly including materials that are essential for a low carbon or green technology for producing green energy. So stuff like whatever you need to build wind turbines, which use a lot of copper and a lot of rare earth elements, and also what you need to build photovoltaic cells in solar panels. And they need stuff like tellurium, germanium, indium, gallium, metals that you just don't really come across in normal life much. And electric vehicles also need a whole range of metals in addition to what was needed for internal combustion cars. So like this, graph just shows this is pretty much everything in excess of what you'd need in an internal combustion engine. And most of these metals are going into the battery and the wiring. And then finally, for it to count as a critical metal, it must be obtained from a supply chain that is vulnerable to disruption. So this map shows the countries accounting for the largest share of the global supply of critical metals. So as you can see, South Africa down there, provides about 90% of the world's iridium. And China is, well, the main single supplier of a whole range of different things. And as you can imagine, anything that disrupts production in one of these countries or export from them will then have a major effect on global industries that are using that material. Now, because it depends on which country is producing what, which country is using what, the criticality of different elements varies from country to country. So quite a few countries have actually issued their own list of critical metals, materials, minerals, each one varying a little bit. This is currently Canada's official critical metal list. 
Um, I just love the fact that we were like, yes, we're making it look like a maple leaf. <laughs> it's awesome. But so why do we as geoscientists, why do we actually care about which minerals make it onto this list? Well, for many of these, especially those used in green technology, the demand is growing really rapidly. For example, this plot is showing the forecast increase in the demand for cobalt from sort of 2020 to 2030. And in this case, that demand increase is largely driven by the demand for batteries, most of which are going into electric vehicles. And we see similar trends for many other critical metals, including nickel and copper, generally driven by the move towards greener, um, greener energy production. And now, if we are going to increase our supply base of critical metals, and specifically, if we want to increase our supply within certain countries or regions, there are two main things that we as geoscientists can do. So one is discover new supplies. So we need exploration. And this is a kind of fun challenge when it comes to critical metals, because critical metals are an artificial group. It's based on economic and political definitions. They don't all occur in like one convenient critical metal or deposit. Instead, they're sourced from a whole range of different deposit types. So exploration for critical metals in, in particular, it really needs to be tailored for which one you're looking for, which group you're looking for, which ones your favorites are at the time. The second way we can get more critical metals is to develop more efficient ways of extracting them from our known ore deposits. And I'm talking about ore deposits that have maybe been mined out for their main commodity, but still contain other elements that we didn't used to care about. Maybe ore deposits that are currently being mined, again, for something else. And I'm also talking about the tailings and the mine dumps. So in many cases, commodities that are critical now, especially the weird, the weird metals that no one's heard of, in many cases, those were previously waste or sub-economic. So some mine dumps might actually contain pretty significant resources. So it's actually quite cool. Um, the Orange River pegmatites in South Africa, where the cool chunk of beryl came from, um, those, it's a whole bunch of lithium bearing pegmatites that were mined in the 60s, 70s, 80s, mostly for mica, which I think was mostly going into like paint and mascara. And they were just kind of getting the spodumene and just chucking it on the side because no one cared about lithium that much at the time. And now people are going back to these old deposits that have been abandoned for 40 years. And they're like, well, cool, we have a waste dump of pure lithium ore, which right now is, well, until recently was a really hot commodity. So suddenly the waste dump becomes your main resource. So firstly, going back to the first option, as an example of exploration targeting critical metals, let's say that we're a company looking for VMS deposits, volcanogenic massive sulfides or volcanic hosted massive sulfides for everyone in Australia. And we might be looking for them because we are exploring for copper, lead, zinc, maybe some gold, silver. But while we're at that, we'd really like to add an additional sweetener. So let's say cobalt, that's a really up and coming critical metal. So we want to find a VMS deposit with cobalt. Well, VMS deposits, they typically form at the sea floor when you have these hot metal rich fluids rising up through the crust and then precipitating metal sulfides kind of at or near the sea floor. As I said, they often have a lot of copper, lead, zinc, sometimes gold, silver, but they also contain a whole range of trace elements, some of which might be critical. And the cool thing with VMS deposits is just that we can see them forming right now on the modern seafloor as black smokers and seafloor massive sulfides. That's just fun. So some VMS deposits contain cobalt and some have almost none. So what is it that makes for a cobalt rich VMS? Well, a recent study by ah, Solstrom and others in 2023 um, looked at the Harvin massive sulfide deposits on the Arctic Mid Ocean Ridge. And they had some samples with about 1% cobalt, which is really good. And this study concluded that the high cobalt content was due to several factors working together. Firstly, they probably had ultramafic or mafic source rocks at depth that could provide that cobalt. Then we had hot, high salinity chloride-rich fluids that could carry the cobalt, 
And then we had focused high temperature venting on the sea floor that precipitated the cobalt in a small concentrated area to get those high grades. So your exploration program for a cobalt bearing BMS should be targeting the high temperature zones or the high temperature deposits associated with mafic or ultra mafic rocks and high salinity hydrothermal fluids. Cool. So as we've just seen, there are a whole bunch of different potential primary controls on critical metals in these deposits from the source of the rocks. Maybe you have ultramafics at depth. Maybe you have metals coming from direct magmatic degassing. Maybe some are being scavenged from seawater. To the conditions of the hydrothermal fluid itself, its temperature, its pH, its redox, its salinity. And then also the conditions at the site of deposition. Are you depositing material on the seafloor or beneath it? Is the fluid venting into oxidized water, reducing water? Is it hot or cold? So this is already quite complex, um, but there's more. And this is the bit that I find really interesting. So for example, these are images by a study by Alexander Kucheron and others in 2020. And they show photomicrographs of germanium bearing sphalerite. So on the left, we have a transmitted light photomicrograph. The dark red areas are quite germanium rich, and the light areas are germanium poor. The labels are showing germanium content in PPM. So you can see pretty extreme difference. The right hand image shows the same area, but this one just outlines grain boundaries in gray. And you can see that that central high germanium area is really coarse grained. In this case, that is primary hydrothermal sphalerite. Whereas the low germanium areas over here are really fine grained. And in this case, this was dynamically recrystallized during deformation, suggesting that dynamic recrystallization, deformation, actually expelled germanium from the sphalerite. Where does it go? Well, here we have some images from Alexander Kudjaran's other work showing how discrete germanium bearing minerals shown by all these yellow dots tend to be concentrated into areas of dynamically recrystallized sphalerite. So it looks like you have sphalerite with germanium, you recrystallize that sphalerite, it kicks out the germanium, and that germanium goes and forms discrete new germanium bearing minerals in those recrystallized areas. So remobilization like this could affect your critical metal distribution at the grain to the deposit scale. And this can have major implications for our second way we spoke about of finding critical metals. That one where we said we're going to try and prove the extraction of them from known deposits. So while the large scale primary controls on critical metal distribution, you know, deposit type, whether it has nice ultramafic source rocks, all of that, those things are really important for exploration, for finding new sources. The more local scale things, understanding the effects of deformation and metamorphism, that's really important for identifying local enrichments, which might make or break the economics of a deposit and will also be really important for when you actually mine and extract these metals. You need to know what minerals they're sitting in and how they're hosted. So that's important for that second way of getting more critical metals. So, like I said, for efficiently extracting critical metals from our ore, you kind of want to know which sulfides or minerals are hosting them and how. Are they solid solution? Are they inclusions? And you also want to know how that might have been affected by tectonic drama, because most of the VMS deposits and many other deposit types that we actually find on land now have been deformed to some degree or other. And now, when I'm talking about remobilization of things, it's important to distinguish between the remobilization or modification of the sulfides and the remobilization of the critical metals or other trace elements that, that might be hosted by those sulfides. So quick crash course in microstructure. So looking at how you modify sulfides. One breather while everyone reads the cool diagram. So one way to modify the microstructure of a sulfide is by mechanical remobilization. So this just means that the sulfide is deforming in the solid state with no fluids involved, no major fluids involved. And this deformation can be accommodated by a range of different mechanisms, depending on the stress and the temperature conditions that it's happening at. So for example, this plot 
is the deformation mechanism map for polycrystalline pyrite. And you can see that at high stress shown on the y-axis and low temperatures on the x, it will deform in a brittle manner. So it will deform by cataclasis, like you see in the picture over here. It's just going to break. If you then look at lower stress and higher temperatures, you get into the ductile realm. So it will deform by crystal plastic mechanisms like dislocation creep, shown over here, or dislocation glide, pressure solution, all depending on what your conditions are. So on the right, I've just shown an EBSD map of pyrotite. So I know it's not pyrite, it's just a really cool map to illustrate this. It's close enough for now. And EBSD is electron backscatter diffraction. We'll talk a bit more about that later. For now, all you need to know is that the colors show the crystallographic orientation. So where you have gradients in color like these, it's just showing that the pyrotite crystal has been bent or deformed. It has internal misorientation. And this is the equivalent of seeing undulose extinction in quartz. Your crystal has just been a little bit deformed. So minerals, sulfides, can also be modified with the help of a fluid phase. So this could be a fluid that dissolves part of the mineral and re-precipitates it elsewhere. This is the solution re-precipitation. Pressure solution is a really well-known example of this, and that's what's shown in this image here, where you start off with your nice euhedral minerals. We're compressing it in the east-west axis in this image. Um, stuff will dissolve from those high-stress, high-pressure sites on the sides and will be pre precipitated in the low-pressure sort of north-south axis, changing the shape of your mineral. A fluid in your fluid-assisted remobilization could also be a melt. So you could partially melt the sulfides themselves. And this mostly occurs in sulfide assemblages that are rich in stuff like antimony or silver, which are known for their low melting points. And finally, sulfides can recrystallize. So this could be static recrystallization, often called annealing, and that tends to coarsen the grains. And this is what you often see when you see that nice foam texture with the 120 degree triple junctions, that's been annealed, statically recrystallized. And that's typically what happens when you maybe metamorphose the deposits at higher temperatures, but with not that much deformation, or maybe the metamorphism was after the deformation, and the sulfides just kind of sat and cooked and annealed. Recrystallization can also be dynamic, in which case it's driven by the recovery of a strained crystal lattice during deformation. And dynamic recrystallization looks really different. It typically creates new, smaller grains. And the specific shape or microstructure of those grains can tell you about what type of dynamic recrystallization occurred. So these are just examples from quartz, actually, but they apply to a lot of minerals, where when you get these really irregular like amoeboid shapes, that's grain boundary migration, typical of high temperature deformation. If you get quite, you know, regular, almost polygonal grains, often surrounding a parent's grains, you get this kind of core and mantle structure. That's typical of subgrain rotation. And then at the low temperature end, but still hot enough to be ductile, you get bulge recrystallization, where just the margins of the grains tend to form these bulges projecting into one another, and those can eventually bud off and form a new grain. So, for example, here we have some images actually from the Cox paper in 1987. So this has been known for a while. On the left, it's showing subgrains forming during SGR, subgrain rotation, and I think this is pyrite. So you can see here's the original parent grain, and it's surrounded by all of its new little recrystallized grains. And on the right, you can see a beautiful bulge just budding off. So that's bulge recrystallization. We were really original when we named these. So one final note on modifying sulfides is that the different sulfides have very different strengths. So this plot is showing the stress needed to deform a sulfide or mineral on the Y. And on the X, the temperature. You can see that pretty much all the sulfides get weaker as it gets hotter, as you'd expect. And generally, pyrite needs a much higher stress than any of the others to deform. It's much more competent, much stronger, much less ductile. Whew. Okay, crash course in microstructure done. 
now we're going to a crash course in geochemistry. Um, so now we're looking at how we can get variations in the chemistry of these minerals based on how we've deformed them or modified them. So this is a figure from Moser et al. 2022. Um, it's actually a paper on titanite. Really interesting, very cool applications to geochronology. Um, but I've just used it here because it illustrates the concepts really nicely. So just pretend that this grain is a sulfide and the shades of blue are the concentration of your favorite critical metal. And what we're looking at here is the distribution patterns we'd expect to result from different sulfide modification processes. So for example, if we look at A, if our pet critical mineral is diffusing in or out of our grain, we'd expect some sort of diffuse donation like this. If you instead look at E, if our sulfide was partially dissolved by fluids at some point, and that material was then re-precipitated, but now with a different critical metal content, we might get something that looks like that. And finally, if we look at F, and this one I've actually adopted, adapted, um, if our sulfide grain experienced this location creep during deformation, it might show subgrains and that internal strain like this. And if our critical metal displays a similar spatial pattern, that suggests it might be affected by dislocation creep. So now that we kind of know what we're looking for, let's have a look at some real world examples. So here's an example from Fuguru et al. 2016 showing an EBSD map of a bent arsenopyrite crystal. This is in a gold deposit somewhere in West Africa. So the key point here is that they didn't actually find any compositional difference associated with that bending. You can see there's a bend where you go from one orientation to another. There's a bend as well. What they did find was that in really strongly bent areas like here, the arsenopyrite had been dissolved and pyrite with a different composition had re-precipitated with less nickel, less arsenic, less gold. So in this case, our culprit for the change in chemistry is actually dissolutionary precipitation, although it did get a bit of a, a leg up from deformation. In contrast, the example we saw earlier of the sphalerite, the dynamically recrystallized areas had much lower germanium. So that's a simple case of blame deformation. That's our culprit. Great. Okay, now we're ready to look at some new results. And this is the stuff we've been working on here at the survey. So for this case study, we chose the Windy Craggy VMS deposit in the spectacular mountains of Northwest BC. Sadly, it didn't involve any field work. I'm really bummed about that, but they were really cool samples. So here you can see the location right up there in the Northwest corner of British Columbia. And we also have a map view of the deposit. So here I'm just showing the different types of massive sulfide in red and yellow. Red, really pyrotite rich, yellow, really pyrite rich. Now, two things made this a really nice deposit for this study. The one is the high cobalt content. You can see it's about 0.07 weight percent cobalt, although it gets much higher in places. And this is nice because we can really get our teeth into the distribution and controls of this particular critical metal. The second thing that's really nice is that the deposits experienced really heterogeneous localized deformation, folding and faulting, during green schist facies metamorphism. So we have both relict undeformed sulfides and deformed sulfides often right next to each other. For example, here we have relatively undeformed massive pyrite. It didn't do much. And here we have highly folded bedded pyrotite. You can see these folds, they're spectacular. This would have been one of my like favorite pet rocks if I'd been able to get to the office in time. It's spectacular. In thin section, you see the same type of thing. Here we've got pyrite framboids, totally undeformed. And here we have our highly deformed friend from the first slide. So now we're gonna take a quick look at the methods I've used, we've been using in the study. So first, I tried to find a sample with less deformed and more deformed sulfides so I can directly compare their compositions. And this is really important, especially in VMS deposits because they have major variations in mineralogy and chemistry sort of from one area of the deposit to the other. So you want to directly compare stuff that you know probably started out the same. 
Then for both my sites, my less deformed and my more deformed, I map the sulfide microstructure using EBSD. And this is the work that Matt Polivchuk was doing. And EBSD, electron backscatter diffraction, is an SEM-based analysis that can map out the crystallographic orientation. So there are a bunch of different ways you can show the data. This image is a map known as an inverse pole figure map, IPF. And in this case, the colors represent grains with different orientations. So where you have really sharp contrasts from there to there, those are two different grains with completely different orientations, separate grains. Where you have gradational contrasts, like up here, that's a single grain with a whole lot of internal strains. So that's a really bent grain, undulose extinction grain. Then we also went and rasted the same area with laser ablation ICPMS to map out the major and trace element composition. And this is the work that Dwayne Petz and Nina Sass were working on. And just for these maps in general, I always use warmer colors to show higher abundances. Don't worry about trying to read the legends, they're tiny. So by combining these data sets along with standard observations, I hope to interpret firstly how the sulfide textures were modified. Were the sulfides partially melted? Were they deformed mechanically? Were they dissolved and reprecipitated? So what was the remobilization mechanism? And then secondly, how did this affect their critical metal and other trace element content? So at Windy Craggy, as with many VMS and modern seafloor deposits, we're dealing with a hydrothermal system that evolved over time. So you tend to get these early lower temperature hydrothermal activity, often depositing pyrite, maybe some galena and sphalerite, often with a, a low temperature trace element signature. They're sitting there full of silver and thallium and lead. And then at Windy Craggy, these early stages are preserved as relict pyrite one and pyrite two. Again, don't worry too much about the details, just know that we have early low temperature pyrite, we've got framboids, we have coliform forms, pyrite two, a little bit higher temperature, it's coarser, more crystalline, kind of overgrowing it. You can see some gray sphalerite in there. Then over time, as the system heats up and grows, we end up getting higher temperature, more massive hydrothermal mineralization forming right in the core of the deposit where it replaces and remobilizes those earlier minerals during zone refining. And this creates the kind of really massive parts of the deposits, the massive pyrite, the massive pyrotite. At Windy Craggy, all of these minerals have been named three. So if I talk about pyrite three, chalcopyrite three, pyrotite three, they're all from this main high temperature stage. And in general, we tend to have massive pyrotite and chalcopyrite, which grades into massive pyrite, and we'll often have sort of big porphyroblasts of pyrite in the pyrotite and chalcopyrite. For this talk, these are the sulfides we're looking at. We're ignoring that early low temperature stuff. We're just focused on this coarse, high temperature main mineralization. So having a look at that stuff, here we have some pyrotite three, the main pyrotite. You can see it's pretty coarse grained. Here, that's a millimeter scale bar. It's quite anhedral. And okay, if we look at the EBSD map, this one does have quite a lot of internal misorientation, but this is like the least deformed example I could find. So this is the closest we have to pristine hydrothermal pyrotite. And the compositional maps of this area show us a few things. So firstly, cobalt does occur in pyrotite, several hundred to a thousand ppm. Whereas other elements like the silver or the indium, also tin and zinc, tend to preferentially go and sit in the chalcopyrite instead. Some elements like lead do occur in the pyrotite, but mostly like sitting on your grain boundaries. Okay, here we're gonna have a look at some massive pyrite. So this is just getting to know our, our baseline, our undeformed examples. So this is just a normal photomicrograph, but the thin section was actually quite tarnished. And that's really nice because it highlights a lot of features. You can actually see like a separate zone over there. You can see a lot of this fine grained spongy structure. And what we're looking at here is this kind of overgrowth of pyrite three, which is overgrown a pyrite two core. And all of the spongy stuff is also pyrite three. 
main high temperature phase. Interestingly, you can't actually distinguish that overgrowth at all in the EBSD map. So the pyrite 3 overgrowth is perfectly epitaxial over the pyrite 2. They have basically the new pyrite 3 mimicked the crystal orientation of the pyrite 2 that it nucleated on. You can see it really nicely in the cobalt composition map, where we have, here's our pyrite 2, low cobalt, overgrown by really high cobalt pyrite 3, in this case up to 6,000 ppm, really juicy. So this pattern that we see with these concentric bands, oscillatory zonation, looks a lot like what we'd expect from growth zoning. And I'll, I'll pop this little summary figure up every now and then just to kind of refer to what we're looking at. And in this case, the higher cobalt content probably reflects that this later pyrite formed at higher temperatures. Maybe the fluid's more saline. Maybe the fluids were just carrying more cobalt. Now, if we look at some other compositional maps, I haven't shown them all here, you can see that the high cobalt is actually associated with a whole range of other metals, bismuth, tin, antimony, tellurium. And previous studies have actually suggested that several of these are typically magmatic. So it looks like our pyrite 3, our main stage mineralization, formed from high temperature hydrothermal fluids with a bit of a magmatic input. That might have been leaching the host rocks, or it might have been direct magmatic volatiles. We're not sure, but magmatism played a role here. Okay, so that's the baseline. That's what the undeformed main stage sulfides look like. Now we're going to see what actually happens when those sulfides were deformed. So now we're in the juicy stuff. So this photomicrograph that you've seen before shows some good examples of the different ways sulfides were modified at Windy Craggy. So pyrotite, which kind of forms the matrix, was mechanically remobilized and typically defines the foliation. Chalcopyrite experienced fluid-assisted remobilization. So it was probably dissolved from somewhere else and then re-precipitated in low strain zones, like these pressure shadows, forming the tails like there and there on the competent porphyroclasts. And pyrite, well, it didn't do much of anything because uh, it's so much stronger than others. But in some cases, like this one, we might have had some recrystallization. But we'll look at that shortly. Firstly, let's look at the pyrotites in some more detail. So here we're looking at a part of a thin section through semi-massive pyrotite. Varies from coarse-grained up here to fine-grained and strongly foliated, really smeared out down here. On the right, I'm showing the EBSD maps for those two areas. And they're at the same scale, so you can see how much coarser-grained this top one is. And you can also see that some of the big grains are really deformed, like we saw earlier. Whereas the bottom map, much finer grained, and most of the grains have a similar orientation because everything in the map is a similar color. Now, another way we can use EBSD data is to plot pole figures, which show the orientations of pyrotite crystals. And these are pretty much like the stereo plots that you'd use to show the orientations of structures you measured in the field. Same idea. And here you can see that the sheared pyrotite, the bottom map, has a much stronger crystallographic preferred orientation. There's a much tighter cluster of orientations. So altogether, this is telling us that the pyrotite deformed mechanically by dislocation creep, and it experienced dynamic recrystallization to form those fine-grained foliated areas. But what did that do to the composition? So here we're looking at a whole bunch of laser ablation ICPMS compositional maps. Again, for the coarse-grained area up top, fine-grained area all along the bottom. The silica map is nice just to orient yourself because the gang minerals stand out really clearly. So you can see like that correlates to that. That one is that one, just to kind of get your eye in. And with the cobalt map, you can see that both the coarse-grained and the fine-grained areas host similar amounts of cobalt. In this case, it's kind of the same legend, about 1,800 ppm. And over here, you can see that lead really likes concentrating along the grain and subgrain boundaries. That's kind of cool. Like here, you can see this grain is all outlined. That is that grain 
But within there, we have this kind of north-south stripe of high lead. That is that subgrain boundary. So it's not just grain boundaries. It's also subgrain boundaries. That's important later. Now, we can also look at sort of high resolution transects through these compositional maps. And this can give us a sense of how the different elements are actually incorporated. For example, this top one is a transect taken through some coarse grained pyrotite. And you can see that some elements show quite uniform distributions. Like we've got cobalt running here, selenium in the green, copper in the yellow. They're all just kind of carrying on no matter what. And these probably occur as substitution elements within the pyrite of pyrotite crystal lattice. They could also maybe be uniformly distributed nanoparticles. Uh, we can chat about the details later if you want. But anyway, they're probably substituting into the lattice. Other elements show big spikes, either associated with inclusions like here, maybe with fractures, maybe with grain boundaries. And these ones are including like silver, molly, lead. They're kind of doing their own thing, getting remobilized, sitting in inclusions. They're not sitting tightly in the crystal lattice. So now we're going to have a look at a second example of pyrotite. And again, just to see, like, is this consistent? And again, we have coarse grained, weakly deformed pyrotite here. You can see how really coarse grained this one is in the EBSD map. And then fine grained, dynamically recrystallized foliated pyrotite down here, really fine grained. And what's kind of cool with this sample is that we also have grains of cobaltite. So that's a, a cobalt arsenic sulfide mineral. And it's been shown by all these pink spots. And you can see that it's actually completely restricted to the recrystallized pyrotite. There are no cobaltite grains in the coarse grained area. And if we zoom in, these are some backscatter electron images. We can see that the cobaltite is typically really nice in euhedral and actually also has these compositional zonations, so like growth zoning. It's pretty cool. But the distribution of this mineral, the cobaltite, sitting in the highly sheared recrystallized areas of pyrotite, that reminds me of the example we saw of the sphalerite, where it recrystallized, kicked germanium out, and it formed germanium minerals. So I thought, well, cool. Maybe when the pyrotite is being dynamically recrystallized, it's expelling cobalt, and that goes and forms these discrete grains of a new cobalt-rich mineral. Really cool model, I like it. Let's just check if it actually works. So to test this, we're gonna have a look at the compositional maps for the sample. Again, for the coarse grained and the fine grained soft areas. Again, silica, just to show you kind of where you have gang. And here we have cobalt and I apologize, the scales are a bit different, so it's not clear, but cobalt here about 1,500 ppm, cobalt here 1,000, 300 ppm. It could be similar, could be different. Okay, we need to do this more quantitatively. So for that, I used principal component analysis and k-means clustering to kind of subdivide the pyrotite in each map into different geochemical groups. So in this case, those groups were the main parts of the pyrotite in bluish, the grain boundaries in green, and then areas next to chalcopyrite in yellowy green, because they just were ridiculously copper rich. And you can actually see the biplots that came out of this on the right here. And you can see, yep, those yellow ones, really copper rich. The greenish areas, the grain boundaries have a whole bunch of things. They've got like lead and silver and funky stuff, antimony. And then the kind of cleanest pyrotite is the blue. That's the main core of the grains. And then I went and plotted these results. So what we care about for now, this is just showing a plot with abundance on the y-axis and some different elements on the x. Don't worry about all of them. What we care about are the main blue, that's the pyrotite in the coarse grained area, and then the blue with the stripes, that's the pyrotite in the fine grained area. And if we have a look at the cobalt content, well, they're statistically identical. <laughs> which really destroyed my model, um, frustratingly mm -hmm. enough. So while deformation did move other stuff around, it didn't affect the cobalt in the pyrotite. It did affect things like, say, selenium, 
that's the coarse grained, that's the fine grained. So recrystallization kicked out some selenium. Here we have um, antimony in the coarse grained stuff, and there's virtually no antimony in the fine grained stuff. So it kicked out all the antimony. And it also went from that much lead to that much lead. So it kicked out quite a lot of lead as well. So deformation did kick out a bunch of elements, but not cobalt. So where did the extra cobalt that we needed to form all the cobaltite, where did that come from? It must have been introduced during deformation from somewhere else. Maybe a different mineral that lost cobalt, maybe an external source. So keep that question in mind. Hopefully we can answer it. So here we can check what the pyrite has been up to. So we've got our usual pyrite friend from the first slide. You can see the EBSD map. Now there's not much internal strain. These are pretty solid colors, but we can see the original single coarse crystal. The relics portions are kind of in the pink. And then that's been partially replaced by these smaller grains over here with different orientations. So this is probably dynamic recrystallization during deformation. What is the stance of the chemistry? Here we have the cobalt map, and this is a really nice one because these old relict portions here and here, you can actually see the oscillatory zonations, just like the pyrite three we saw earlier. So like we said earlier, this is growth zoning during the original hydrothermal formation of the pyrite here and here. Then in the recrystallized areas like this, these zonations have been destroyed or modified or just mushied. These areas also tend to have slightly higher cobalt, which suggests that dynamic recrystallization of pyrite did actually affect the chemistry and actually increased the cobalt slightly. And then we also see something that doesn't show up in the EBSD, a rim outlining the whole aggregate. You can see it there, there, there. And this is a high cobalt, high arsenic rim. Now, this could reflect diffusion of cobalt and arsenic into the rims, but there's no evidence that cobalt or arsenic were lost from the interior. We still have those oscillatory zonations preserved. And we saw earlier that pyrotite didn't, like the pyrotite outside here, didn't expel cobalt. So, oh, and we have quite sharp boundaries. We don't have this diffuse zonation. So what this room probably is, is epitaxial growth of new metamorphic pyrite. And that must have been precipitated from fluids carrying cobalt and arsenic. So again, let's just double check, see if this is consistent with some other samples. Here we have another pyrite grain, again, the EBSD map. Again, we can see the surviving areas here in the pink, dynamically recrystallized areas here. And again, the surviving relic hydrothermal areas have some cobalt. So there was cobalt in the original hydrothermal fluids. The recrystallized areas over here have higher cobalt. So during deformation, pyrite actually took up a little bit of additional cobalt. And then we have that high cobalt and arsenic rim, which must post-date the dynamic recrystallization. So it was probably peak metamorphism just after the deformation. And this also reflects additional cobalt. Now again, we can look at the distribution of elements in the pyrite. Now we're looking at a transect through this exact grain. And we can see some of them are uniformly distributed, again, like the cobalt over here, selenium, arsenic do the same. They're probably substitution elements. Cobalt substitutes for iron, arsenic might be direct for sulfur, selenium might be direct for sulfur. Some others are probably incorporated through coupled substitution. Silver, antimony, gold, thallium, they don't have quite the right charge, so they have to do coupled substitution to make things work. But they are also still fairly consistent, so they are substitution. And some elements show both sort of smooth distributions, so they're there as substitution elements, and spikes, so they're also there as inclusions. And that's stuff like copper, where you can see these big spikes in the green. There's an inclusion, there's an inclusion, there it's probably substitution, there's an inclusion. Okay, again, we did principal component analysis, k means clustering, extracted the chemistry data for different groups of pyrite, and those groups are shown here. You can see in pink, which matches the colors in this plot, pink is the relic hydrothermal pyrite, 
recrystallized pyrite is orange. That, bound, that rim of high cobalt, that's in lighter orange. And yellow are the grain boundaries because they do their own thing. And we can actually see here what these different textures or modifications were doing to the chemistry. So if we go from relict pyrite in pink to recrystallized in orange, we can see that cobalt goes up but doesn't change a huge amount. Arsenic barely change, doesn't change. Selenium doesn't change. So those were the elements that we said were probably direct substitutions. And that makes sense. They're tightly bound in the pyrite crystal structure. They might change a little bit, but not much. In contrast, the elements that were you know, maybe coupled substitution and some of them were inclusions, those were mostly expelled. You can see here silver, that's in the hydrothermal pyrite, it's gone. Molybdenum, hydrothermal pyrite, and the recrystallized, it's gone. Tin, it's gone. Gold, it's gone. Lead, we've dropped a whole lot. Bismuth, we've dropped a whole lot. The rim, well, it doesn't depend on anything else because it's new material that formed. So it just reflects the kind of new conditions. And those new conditions were rich in arsenic and rich in cobalt. And then in yellow, those are the grain boundaries. You can see they're rich in all those things that got kicked out of the pyrite. So the silver, going from hydrothermal pyrite, you recrystallized it, kick out the silver. Silver's sitting on the rims. Same story here with tellurium, same story with gold, lead, and bismuth. So we've got a whole bunch of different elements doing different things. So we're almost done. We're just going to have a quick look at the sphalerite. So I haven't done much work on this, but the preliminary results are quite interesting. We've got coarse, dark red hydrothermal sphalerite cut by this narrow zone of paler sphalerite. If we look at the EBSD maps, you can see the coarse dark area, really coarse grained, and it has a lot of twins, loads and loads of twins, just like feldspar. The pale stuff is really fine grained, so fine grained, we have to go to another really zoomed in EBSD map here. That's this one. And now you can see that we have tiny sphalerite grains, and some of the coarser ones have a lot of internal distortion. So again, this is probably deforming by dislocation creep and dynamic recrystallization during deformation. Comparing this to the compositional map, in this case, we're looking at gallium. We can see that it's mostly concentrated right in the cores of some of these really coarse grains. And it has lower abundances along grain and twin boundaries. It also looks just like what we'd expect if gallium was removed from the coarse grain sphalerite by diffusion kind of these gradually decreasing diffuse zonations. So this gallium is probably lost by volume diffusion and then removed from along the grain boundaries with the help of a fluid phase that kind of took it away somewhere. We haven't found it yet. In contrast, silver is much higher in the recrystallized fine-grained area. And this could be a case of sphalerites taking up silver during dynamic recrystallization, maybe. But we look here, you also have silver outlining a lot of grains, outlining twin boundaries. It's probably more a case of the silver just like sitting on grain boundaries. And in the fine grained area, you have a lot more grain boundaries. And this is kind of supported if we look at a few other maps, also in other sulfides. Silver, antimony, lead, bismuth, they all just love sitting on grain boundaries. Here we are looking at lead maps. You can see it outlines the grains and it even outlines the twins in the sphalerite. It also outlines a whole lot of stuff in the pyrite and outlines dynamically recrystallized pyrotite. So this suggests that wherever the silver, lead, bismuth, and timony come from, they're really mobile. But one question here is that were they introduced from some external source and just carried in by fluids? Or are they more locally derived? So if we have a look at the pyrotite chemistry plot again, you'll recognize this sample. And you'll remember that pyrotite did release silver. It was going from, that's the coarse grain pyrotite, that's the fine grain pyrotite. So it lost some silver, which went and sat on grain boundaries. It lost a whole lot of antimony from there to there, which went and sat on grain boundaries over there. Same with lead. Okay, bismuth's a bit weird in this one. But so pyrotite did release silver, antimony, and lead during deformation that went and sat on the grain boundaries. If we look at the pyrite plot again, 
like we saw earlier, Pyrite released a whole range of things. It released silver, went and sat on the grain boundaries. Same thing with gold, same thing with lead, and in this case, with bismuth. So, were these just moving in a fluid phase? If they were, we'd expect to see them everywhere, outlining quartz, outlining chlorite, outlining everything. Instead, they only outline our sulfide minerals. Also, there's a slightly different group outlining boundaries in pyrite versus boundaries in pyrotites versus boundaries in sphalerite, which suggests that these elements didn't move beyond the edges of their original parent sulfide. So these are probably things that when the sulfide recrystallized, it expelled these elements from the core of the grain, the interiors, to the various high or low angle boundaries nearby, whether it's a grain boundary or a subgrain boundary or a twin boundary, the elements went and accumulated there. And this might have been by a method called pipe diffusion, when they move along dislocation arrays like subgrains, or by dislocation impurity pair diffusion, when you have dislocations moving through your crystal lattice during deformation, and they just kind of entrain elements into them and carry them along. Okay. Enough technical stuff. Let's just summarize the main points. So we can expand on this cartoon we saw earlier, just showing the hydrothermal stage of the deposit, and we can add the tectonic drama. Okay, let's just zoom in on the tectonic bit. And in general, pyrotite was fairly incompetent. It was weak. It was pretty much all mechanically remobilized, dislocation creep, dynamic recrystallization. It took up a whole lot of strain. Pyrite, the yellow, much stronger it preserves a whole lot of those early hydrothermal textures and compositions. But some of it did get dynamically recrystallized over here. In general, elements that are present in pyrite and pyrotite as direct substitutions were mostly retained, maybe even slightly enriched during recrystallization. Coupled substitution elements, they're much more loosely held. Those and inclusions were expelled, and some of them, like silver, lead, bismuth, and antimony, migrated from the grain interiors to various boundaries and kind of concentrated there. Sphalerite also records some local dynamic recrystallization, and it also lost elements like gallium by volume diffusion. And the last thing before I leave you in peace is the question of the cobalt. We've got these cobaltite grains sitting in the dynamically recrystallized parts of the pyrotite. We've seen that that cobalt didn't come from the pyrotite, because the pyrotite didn't change cobalt when it deformed. It didn't come from the pyrite. Pyrite actually took up cobalt when it got deformed. And the new pyrite, that rim all around the edge, is even higher in cobalt. So all of this is telling us that during deformation and metamorphism, we must have added a whole lot of extra cobalt to this deposit. We're still working on exactly where that came from. It might have been coming from, again, the magic mafic, ultra mafic rocks at depth that during metamorphism could have released some more cobalt, which then went and got trapped in the deposit. But overall, it's really cool if you're looking for a cobalt bearing VMS deposit, because it says, maybe look for one that's been deformed and metamorphosed, because you might have upgraded your cobalt. And with all of that, I will say thank you very much for listening. And uh, shout if you have any easy questions. Thank you so much, Taryn. That was, um, you're a brilliant speaker. Thank you for sharing all of that with us. Thank I you. Uh, really appreciate it.